Welcome to the Informed Simplicity Project, a place for students searching for the informed simplicity on the far side of complexity. Today, I have a great interviewer, uh, interviewee, um, and I'm super, super excited to talk about this topic. Um, she is more than qualified, um, but I would love for her to give a brief introduction for herself before we dive in. So can you give us a brief introduction? Sure. Um, my name is Peggy Kleinplatz, and I'm a professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Uh, mostly what I teach about is sexuality. So I teach counseling students and, uh, for that matter, med students about how to deal with sexuality with their clients or patients. I'm the author of a recent book called Magnificent Sex Lessons from Extraordinary Lovers, and my understanding is we're going to be talking today about my general research and clinical focus, which is magnificent sex. There we go. Absolutely. Um, and before we dive into the book, which is a great book, um, can you give us a little bit of background? How did you background? How did you get into the field of counseling and then sex sex therapy? Um, that was always my dream. Wow. I. Um, came from a very sex positive family and was really blessed with that and knew that I wanted to grow up to be a clinical psychologist because it was one route into becoming a sex therapist. There you go. And so then you just wrote this book, which is, it's like brand new. It came out this year, just a few months ago. Yeah, it came out in the middle of COVID, so. <laughs> middle of COVID season, when everyone's, you know, cooped up in their houses anyway, so. It's, it's perfect to see well, I'm hoping I'll give them something interesting to do. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about the research that went into the uh, book? Sure. Um, can I tell you how it all started? Absolutely. So I've spent a lot of my career asking people about their best sexual experiences. And the most common thing that sex therapists deal with all day every day is people who have low desire, no desire, low frequency of sex, no frequency of sex, and sexual desire discrepancy, which is when a couple is in distress because one wants more sex than the other and they're arguing about it. So for most of my career, for about 25 years, I had a waiting list of like seven and a half months. And I'd call a couple back after about six months and say, okay, I have an opening coming up in just six weeks. And they'd say, thanks, we got divorced three months ago. And I just couldn't sleep at night because it felt terrible to have such a long waiting list. And everyone was dealing with the same kind of problems on my waiting list. Now I'm going to shift. In 2003, 2004, during that academic year, I was teaching my human sexuality class and there was this student who kept on raising her hand and asking questions about the research that I was citing. I'd say this, I'd say that, and she'd say, but Cosmo says this, and GQ says that, and on the web it says this. Long story short, this undergrad named Dana Menau became my graduate student and then a PhD student, and she's now Dr. Dana Menau and the co-author in this book. She and I decided to study people who were having really, really amazing sex to learn what really great sex looks like and how that's different from the descriptions in media or porn or everybody's myths, and to see if what we could learn from people having really great sex might have some implications for people who were sexually miserable. Wow, there you go. So could you talk a little bit about what the sort of popular narratives are, the ones that aren't really informed by, by research? Sure, so one of the common myths that shows itself everywhere is that sex is for the young and beautiful. And the reality is that sex is for all kinds of people, the young and the old, the able-bodied and the not so able-bodied, the beautiful and the people who are beautiful in your eyes. And 
in our studies of what optimal sexual experience looks like, we studied a lot of people, but one group of them were people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now, normally we don't think of people that old as the paragons, the models, the exemplars of great sex. But it occurred to me after many years of clinical experience that sometimes these were in fact the ideal role models. These were people who came into my office who had had a lifetime of very fulfilling sex, but then something changed. Uh, One of them developed diabetes. One of them developed cancer. They had a death in the family. Somebody got fired. There were changes in financial circumstances or they were empty nesters. And they suddenly had to renegotiate what is sex. And the fact of having to renegotiate it meant revisioning sexuality in ways that called for creativity and imagination such that their sex lives as they revisioned sexuality in their 60s, 70s, and 80s was better than anything they'd ever experienced before. So that would be one of the really popular myths. Would you like another? Yes. Another really popular one is sex should be natural and spontaneous, which drives me nuts. So that couples constantly walk into my office and they say, you know, when we first met each other, We had sex all the time. It was effortless. We would just melt into each other's arms every time we saw each other. It was natural, spontaneous. And one of the things that my research has done is help to unpack that myth. So think back to the early times in any new relationship. It looks like it's natural and spontaneous, but it's really not. I mean... You finish with school or work for the day, and then you go to the gym, and then do you go have sex? No. You shower. You groom. You shave. You put on your favorite cologne or aftershave. You get rid of that gray underwear with the fraying elastics, and you hide that away. In fact, you hide all your laundry. Maybe you hide your dishes. You may actually do your laundry or your dishes, but you hide them. You put product in your hair, and then you do whatever it is that makes you feel attractive in your own eyes, having called or texted or something each other during the day to sort of prime the pump, if you know what I mean. So that when you finally see each other after hours and hours and hours of planning, You can now create the illusion of it being natural and spontaneous when it never was. Once people move in together, they can no longer fake natural and spontaneous because now the effort shows. So what's so bad about showing effort? What's so bad about saying to somebody, okay, it never was natural and spontaneous. I always thought you were worth the effort. And now that we're living together or married or we've been married for 20 years, you're still worth the effort. So those would be some of the common myths that we come across and how we've tried to debunk them. I love that. I love that idea, right? That all these things are just symbols of, hey, you're worth the effort. You're actually worth the effort. That's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. So then you guys, so I would love to get in then to what are some of the um, re- realities. Before we do that, though, can you talk about how you did the research? Like, did you have groups? Did you have individual? Like, what was your research process like? Sure. Well, we spent some time trying to figure out. You know, if we're going to study really great sex, who do we study? And based on my clinical work, it was pretty clear that part of what gets in the way of people ever experiencing the best of the best is a heteronormative kind of box that most people live in. So we needed people outside the box. And that meant that we went looking for LGBTQ people and people who were into kink or BDSM, people who were poly or consensually non-monogamous. We wanted the whole spectrum of people who don't fit into the conventional box of this is what sex is. You know, the 
fit part A into slot B version of what sex is. So we started recruiting from various um, sexual minority type groups, who I'm not so sure are minority, but that's another story. And as I said a moment ago, we also decided to recruit old people, old married people. And by married doesn't mean heterosexually married. This is Canada after all. Um, it meant people who had been partnered in a relationship with somebody for at least 30 years. Wow. Yeah. To find out what the secrets were that enabled them to have better and better sex as time went on. What were they doing right? And the third set of people that we recruited were sex therapists. We thought, okay, who thinks about sex all day and the whole range of sexualities? And I thought, I do. Maybe my colleagues do too. So we had roughly uh, 30 or so, quote unquote, sexual minorities and about 30 or so old married people and another 20 or so sex therapists. That's a pretty good sample size. Yeah, that's, I think that's... it's the largest phenomenological research project ever done. Wow. Most phenomenology studies have like six to 12 people, and we had 75. Wow. Yeah, we were very pleased. <laughs> how, long, how long did it take you to get all those people to talk to? That's a lot of people. How long did it take you? Well, the recruiting took place in about a week. We were stunned. We got more people who volunteered than we could interview in a lifetime. And each interview was pretty long. They were an average about an hour and a half, two hours. If you've ever tried to transcribe interviews, that's a lot of hours. <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's a lot of grat, grat assist. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what that is. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of, wow. Um, so you do all that work, and what what year did you guys start? We started in 2005, and we finished all our interviews by 2012. Wow. Yeah. And so how come you guys waited on publishing the book? Well, we published uh, about 10 different peer-reviewed articles in archival journals and more and more people kept saying, you know, you need to get this out to the world, not just your fellow academics. So after publishing everything that's in the book, we decided we'd finally put it all together in one book. There you go. Um, and the book is super reader, reader friendly. I was surprised, you know, most, I could, most books based on research, which is, which is few, tend to sound like they're based on research. And this book was very reader, reader friendly. Um, well, thank you. That, that means a lot to me. Um, let me tell you, the first draft was very research. Heavy. <laughs> and we rewrote, rewrote, rewrote until we finally ended up with something that our fellow researchers and our fellow sex therapists could understand and grasp, but could also be um, understandable to the people who are asking themselves, you know, is this all there is? Could there be something better in bed? People who are disillusioned with their sex lives or people who are happy but want it to be even better. So I, I hope we're going to reach all those audiences. Uh, I think that's a great segue into what you guys found. What did, what did you guys find? What are the components? Well, we ended up doing six major studies where the sixth one is ongoing. The first one, we had to just find an empirical description of what makes sex amazing. And so it took us the first couple of years to find out what are the components of optimal sexual experience, and we found eight of them. The first one that is the one that was most predominant, the one that people tended to mention first, was being present in the moment. But at a fairly high level, this is not the stuff that we hear about in mindfulness-based CBT interventions, where people are just present enough so they can ignore distractions. 
this is a whole other level. This is where people are so absorbed in the moment that an atom bomb could drop and they wouldn't notice it. So this is about being completely, totally, utterly embodied. And the second component is about being fully connected with another person so that you can't tell where their skin starts and your skin stops. Being completely merged, being completely aligned and connected. And the people we interviewed tended to use a lot of language that came from physics because we just don't have it in the world of psychology or counseling. They talked about conductivity or electricity that wraps itself around you. And, you know, if we just stop with those two for two seconds before I get to the next six, think about those two coexisting at the same time. I mean, it's one thing to be present in the moment if you're by yourself in a yoga class. The big question several years later in the research becomes, how do we get people to be fully embodied while also fully connected to another person, which is an interesting clinical challenge, which I'll be happy to tell you about later. The third one was about deep sexual neurotic intimacy, which is surely about love, but Interestingly, very few of our participants used the word love. They mostly talked about, I care about this person so deeply. This person's pleasure is as important to me or more so than my own. And I really like this person. I can really groove on this person. This is a person I enjoy and delight in. And then our fourth component was deep empathic communication. And that's not just the usual low-level communication of I statements and paraphrasing. It's really, really being able to reach a point where you can feel inside the other space with what you say and the ways that you listen, the ways that you touch so as to feel inside the other person under their skin. And the ways in which you let yourself be felt through touch. So if you want to picture the opposite, you know that feeling that you get in your body when a doctor's just entered the room and they're about to give you a vaccine and you know your whole arm tenses up? Yeah? Yeah. Well, picture the opposite. Picture the way your body melts when someone's about to touch you that will feel like exactly what you need so that someone really can feel you can metaphorically penetrate you through the way that person touches you. So that's, that's a really important one. And then the next one is about exploration, fun, interpersonal risk-taking. So in the world of sexology, when we talk about risk-taking, we talk about it as a bad thing. You know, how do we prevent people from taking sexual risks from unwanted pregnancies or STIs or sexual assault? But the people we interviewed were talking about a whole other kind of risk taking. There's a kind of sex where it's like you're jumping off cliffs together while holding hands and you're tumbling together in midair. Really daring together and laughing. And then the sixth component is about authenticity, genuineness, transparency. It's about really letting yourself be yourself, which most of us are afraid to do in bed. And then the seventh is about being authentic with another person, which means our seventh component is about vulnerability and surrender. It's about letting yourself be yourself, being physically and emotionally naked while somebody is looking at you and through you and can really see who you are in your most vulnerable moments. 
And if you've got all of those seven components working together, then you might end up with what turned out to be the final component. Transcendence. Transformation. A chance to be on a journey with another person where new parts of yourself and each other are revealed. It's a mouthful, huh? Yeah. So that was we found what we found in our first study. Um, this is what great sex looks like for those who've actually lived it. It's not about this technique or that trick or keeping novelty alive in the relationship. It's not about buying the right sex toy. It's about these eight things. And then we did five more studies, and I'm happy to walk you through any or all of them as you wish. Yeah, let's 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 keep going. Why don't you walk us through, through some more? So our next study was about what can we learn from extraordinary lovers that might be relevant for ordinary people and their therapists. And probably the most important couple of things we learned were that great lovers are made and not born. So we asked everybody, you know, how, how did you first start having these optimal sexual experiences? Were you, were you always like this from the first time you had sex? And they all cracked up laughing. And we said, okay, well, when did you first start having experiences of this caliber? And most people said in their 50s which was very upsetting to our research team because none of us had yet hit our 50s. Most of our research team were like (laughs) undergrads, grad students, so like late teens, mid-20s, and saying, what, I have to wait another 30 years before I can start having great sex? And in fairness, we had to say, okay, but that's an empirical question. You know, give us time and we'll find out if any old person can have great sex or even could any young person have great sex or do you have to be old? So um, I'll tell you about that when we get to our sixth study because, you know, we needed to know that. But when we asked great lovers how they got to be that way or the people we now call extraordinary lovers, they said, you know, it didn't happen overnight And their perceptions of what great looked like had changed over time so that when they were in their teens, they thought getting laid was really great. And in their 20s, they thought getting laid without their parents walking in was really great. In their 30s, they thought getting laid without their kids walking in was really great. And in their 40s, they started to ask, "Um, is that all there is? This is it? That's the best we can do? You know, repeat for the next 40 years. This is it. And mostly by their 50s, they'd started to become honest enough about themselves and each other and what they wanted to aim higher. So, you know, if I have one lesson for all your students, it's don't settle. Don't lower your expectations. Raise them. And then the second thing that we learned from the extraordinary lovers when we asked, you know, what what did you do or learn or become or something? What 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 did you have to do in order to start on the journey towards optimal erotic intimacy? They all cracked up laughing and said, the first thing I had to do was unlearn everything I'd ever learned about sex growing up. Just let it go. And that was really crucial for them. Absolutely crucial. That it's precisely the box that we're constrained into when we're very young that says sex looks like this that you have to get out of if you're ever going to find out what makes you glow in the dark. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So I would say those are probably the two big lessons. I mean, there were plenty of others, but yeah, two of the big lessons that we learned about uh, how to 
start on that pathway. We're recognizing, you know, extraordinary erotic intimacy is not just for a few people. It's for those of us who want to aim high. Not everybody wants to, but for those who want to, they're going to have to do a lot of unlearning before they start to discover what it is that is right for them. In, and oh, sorry. Please go ahead. I was just going to uh, ask a, ask a question. In um, in many ways, what you're talking about sounds to me like the hero's journey. You know, it sounds like um, I think in some ways we're all sort of. I heard a, a term once called the fidelity of betrayal, and it's this idea that in order for us to be faithful to our, our parents and what they want for us, and every good parent wants their kid to be better than the parent was, we have to end up betraying um, some of the ideas and um, conceptions that our parents parents handled, handed us. And so in some ways, it sounds like this is an extension of that or maybe a parallel idea of like, you have to be willing to challenge the conventions that got you to where you are so that you can go further. Yeah, I, I think you're onto something that's really profound. I mean, we aren't going to get any further than what we've learned unless we're willing to be on a pathway of discovery rather than replication. Yeah. <clears throat> we can go much further than we can imagine if we're willing to imagine further than anything we've encountered so far. So we're talking about revisioning sex itself. What did you guys learn in the in the in the next study? Well, we're phenomenologists um, rather than quantitative type researchers at heart. So we didn't set out to study group differences or lack of group differences. We weren't doing ANOVAs, MANOVAs, ANCOVAs, even t tests. We were studying experience. So. The next study that we did was truly serendipitous. We didn't go looking for it. My co-author, Dana Menard, and I were the only ones who, based on the ethics protocol, knew who was who in each interview. So she and I conducted all the interviews together, and then the members of the research team rated the transcripts as we were coming up with a coding system, and all the other things we were wanting to study. And as they read each transcript, they'd say stuff like, oh, that guy sounds really hot. Or, boy, that old woman has a really rich sex life. Or, that sounds like one very kinky individual. And we'd always say, what makes you say that? Because they got it wrong every time. <laughs> the hot young guy was an 80-year-old woman. The person they thought was a little old lady was a kinky, poly, bi, trans person. Uh, they got all their guesses wrong every time. The only thing they got right was occasionally they'd say, oh, God, not another sex therapist transcript. And we'd say, well, what would make, make you say that? And they'd say, it's boring. And they were right. They never got the sex therapist wrong. So it took us until 2013, but we finally wrote a paper. And the first page of the paper says, we apologize profusely to our fellow phenomenologists. We were not interested in group differences, but we couldn't help but find this weird finding. Um, there are no differences between men and women. There are no differences between the young and the old, the kinky versus the vanilla the LGBTQ versus the straight, they all look alike when they glow in the dark. The only ones who are the outliers are sex therapists. But everybody else, their descriptions of the best sexual experiences are identical. It's wild. So we found out that there's this huge commonality among us at the heights of erotic intimacy. 
I mean, I don't study bad sex. Lots of other sex therapists study bad sex. And I don't study whatever you mean by normal sex. I don't even know what that is, aside from the physiology of sexual response. But I do study great sex. And the so-called differences between men and women, like men are all genitally focused and women are all relationship focused, none of that turns out to be true when it comes to studying magnificent sex. So that was kind of cool. And we eventually had to publish it because it was true. So why did the sex therapists have all these different, like, why, why, why were they different? Is it, is it the training so that they're trained, but they're being educated in like myths or I don't know? Well, I think because nobody ever studied great sex before. And what they were talking about was based on what the research and clinical training tells you about ordinary sex. And maybe there really are differences or not, I don't know, between say men and women or LGBTQ folk versus straight folk when it comes to bad sex. But no one had ever studied peak sexual experiences before, so it never occurred to them that when you get to the heights of sexual experience, it's more than heterosexual intercourse requiring normal sexual functioning. So we couldn't resist publishing it. They were also very serious. None of the sex therapists mentioned that what makes it great requires laughter, taking risks, um, and that you could do it outside the confines of monogamous relationships. That's hilarious. That's so funny. So, yeah, with apologies, we published that um, and said to our fellow phenomenologists, we found a lack of group differences. We had to say it out loud. And with apologies to our fellow sex therapists, I'm not sure I want to have sex with any of you. (laughs) So what was the the next study that um, was the natural outcome? Yeah, that the next study was about what are the facilitating factors that help to bring about magnificent sex. Um, And we found seven major categories of facilitating factors. And I can't possibly take you through all of them. You have to, oh God, I sound like everybody. Uh, You have to read the book. You have to read the book. (laughs) But some of the really important ones are empathic communication and being able to find the ways of being fully embodied while engaged with another and impressive rather than merely effective skills of verbal and touch communication and vulnerability combined with the freedom to take chances without worrying about making mistakes. I mean, there were so many of our participants who said, you know, if I learned anything from anyone, I learned from everyone, including the lousy sex. If only because I learned, okay, I don't ever want to do that again, and I don't have to do that again. But at least I learned about it. I mean, they often said, you know, you have to be able to laugh at yourself if you're going to learn how to make it even better for the next time. You, you so, hit on something that I think is a great thing to sort of come back to this, this idea of um, being fully present, but then also fully connected. Yeah. 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 And I don't know about you, but none of my graduate school training helped me figure that one out. <laughs> how, I mean, um, I know this is maybe a, a digression, but how do we, how do we, what does that look like? And then how do we learn that? How do we teach that? Well, you know, after studying this stuff for a very long time, did you read the Harry Potter books? Of course. Okay. Did you ever see any of the Harry Potter movies? I, I did, yeah. Perfect. So I remember the first time I was watching Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the first movie. And you see Harry Potter 
and Ron and Hermione starting their way up towards the Gryffindor common room. And they get on this staircase, and then it starts moving. And they realize they're going to have to jump off of one staircase, even while it's moving, to jump onto the next staircase, which is also moving. And they still have to keep climbing upwards towards the Gryffindor common room while the ground under their feet is literally shifting. And as we were doing this research, that was the image that kept on hitting me, that these were people who were willing to just set forth on this journey, knowing they were going upwards, but where the path itself was shifting, and they had to be prepared to shift with it, even while it wasn't at all clear what was up at the top, but they had to be willing to keep moving, even in the face of uncertainty. So this isn't obvious. This isn't predictable. And so when we made our way towards our fifth and sixth studies, which were literally trying to answer the question, you know, can anybody do this? First of all, it seemed like the this part was going to be unique from one person to the next. The journey was going to be unique from one couple to the next. And as both lovers and therapists, we had to be prepared for a fair bit of staying with it, even while it was not going to be predictable. So, you know, in our current study, what we're looking at is, can we help couples who are unhappy in their sex lives, couple with the couples I talked to you about at the beginning with no desire, low desire, no frequency, low frequency and distress over sexual desire discrepancy. Could we take those couples and help them on the journey towards optimal sexual experience? And the answer had to be only if we as therapists are willing to let go of everything we thought we knew. So this is not going to be like a manualized treatment. We've now been training therapists in how to use the principles we got from the extraordinary lovers to help distressed couples for the last seven years or so. And it's a journey each time. It's not, okay, you know, we're going to give you some Viagra. Or, here, try this lube. Or something else that's predictable. It's going to be that we as therapists have to get creative and it means we're going to have to customize therapy which for me at least is very exciting yeah because it's never the same yeah I don't want to do the same thing twice So in our fifth study, we asked ourselves, you know, what are the pathways towards optimal sexual experience? And as I know you know, there's quite a debate in the literature. You know, is it attachment? Or differentiation. Yeah. That's the question, right? And our answer is yes. It's attachment and a differentiation. It's not either or. It's both and And there are different pathways for different people and at different times in their lives. Sometimes one person's way of being, someone who's very differentiated and is able to be honest and straightforward, sexually open and uninhibited, makes it safe for somebody else to be feeling secure and trusting and to create the kind of relationship in which they both then head towards optimal sexual experience. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's the relationship that we share which makes it possible for one or both of us to experience moments of utter abandon while being connected to each other, and that leads to optimal sexual experience. So, you know, we found out in our fifth study there there are different pathways 
plural, not just one. And then our sixth study, which is still ongoing, is the answer to that question. Can anybody have great sex or is it only for, you know, some lucky people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s? And what are you guys finding in that sixth study? Well, we tried developing a therapy approach. So it's an approach. It's not a method that works off of the eight components and the seven facilitating factors and the different pathways. And we created an approach and we tried it out on groups and why groups rather than couples, you might ask, Um, because I'd had a waiting list that went on forever. And I wanted to do something that spoke to social justice Let's face it, what it costs to see a therapy, uh, to be in therapy with a therapist, is not cheap. And not everybody has insurance that will cover them. And I had a waiting list that went on forever. So I thought, what if we get couples into group therapy filled with other couples who have problems around desire and frequency and sexual desire discrepancy? And could we try that approach with them? Would it work? And of course, initially, everybody said, um, what about ethics? What about confidentiality? And we said, well, we'll have everybody make up names. So, for example, in our 2016 group, early fall of 2016, we had a couple who called themselves Bill and Hillary. (laughs) <laughs> and we had uh, Pebbles and Bam Bam and Fred and Wilma and then another couple who wanted to call themselves um, Donald and Ivanka and everyone said oh, that's incest, that's really gross and they said would you rather Donald and Melania and they said wait a minute, never mind Never mind. And they decided to go with Tony and Carmela Soprano. Hilarious. So we've been running. I don't know if you, you Donald and Hillary in the same group. That might, that might, just make, it, that might make it complicated. It, it, it was interesting to watch. <laughs> yeah, everyone was grossed out quickly. Remember, we're Canadians. And we had another couple that decided to call themselves Justin and Sophie, which are the names of our prime minister and his wife, Justin Trudeau and Sophie Grégoire. So people make up all kinds of fun names. And of course, the first session is about, you know, what comes up in the room stays in the room. But we've been running these groups for a long time now, and they work. And once we discovered that they work, we also started training people from all over North America. So from Northern Ontario to uh, Boston, to Seattle, to San Francisco, and New York, and even where you are in the Midwest. And we wanted to see, you know, could anybody learn this approach and have it work with their clients and offer it at a price that's really accessible to people who don't have a lot of money and who don't have insurance. And it turns out to work and be accessible and that means that I got rid of my waiting list. If a new client calls me tomorrow, they're going to see me right away. Well, maybe not so much under COVID, but you get the idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so look, we're coming up on our time, and I want to be very respectful of, of your time. How much more time do you, do you have left? I want to be very honoring of that. Um, I've got another five or ten minutes, if that works for you. That's perfect. Okay, so... Um, I guess I have, I'll ask two or three really quick questions and then we'll sort of wrap up. Um, you're, you, one of the things you were talking about is how you've had a waiting list. And I guess my, my big question is, um, you've been in the field for over 25 years? Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, how many how many sessions have you typically seen? Do you see your your typical your typical couple? Well, the rule of thumb in the literature 
is that for every year a couple has had a problem with desire, count on a month worth of therapy, where a month equals four hours, for every year that they've had the problem. So they've had the problem for 20 years, then count on 20 months of therapy. So that's 20 times four, that's 80 hours of therapy. That's a lot of therapy, and that's very expensive. So we really wanted to find something that works faster, and this group therapy approach is designed to work in 16 hours, and it does. So we're getting significant changes from the initial assessment to the final 16th hour, and we're doing two hours a week. So it's only eight weeks. Eight weeks, and then we measure again at six-month follow-up to see in six months without therapy, have they reverted back to where they were or do the changes hold? It turns out the changes hold. So, this so is, the group work therapy works well, it works fast, it works effectively, and the changes hold. And it's inexpensive, which is important to me as, as a human being. So, so this, is my, this is my question, and uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, of a devil's, devil's advocate question. Um, it seems like that you are seeing lots of people who say that the primary issue is um, sex. Do you agree with that or do you feel like maybe there's another underlying issue and the sex problem is just a symptom of that? Oh, sex is never just about sex. And that I think is absolutely crucial for helping to work with people who are having bad sex good sex, or to understanding magnificent sex. Sex, the way it's portrayed in the media, is in a vacuum, as if sex is about just, you know, hard penises, wet vaginas, whatever. And it's never just that. It's always contextual. It's always about the relationship. It's always about the hopes and dreams and fears of each of the people involved in those sexual relations. It's always complex. And that's where the media gets it wrong, whether we're talking about mainstream media or romance novels or porn, um, where sex looks simple. It's never what it seems to be. And part of the fun part of doing an assessment is understanding the people who are attached to their reproductive organs and understand what sexuality is about for each person. Wow. Okay, so here are my last two questions and then we'll uh, get out of here. My last question is, obviously, you're on the edge of the field, you're on the, the forefront, at least from where I stand. Um, who do you, what, what do you think is even more on the forefront, right? Like, if you were to say, man, I would think people should be looking at, at, at this what would what would you look at? What would you research? What would you read read about? You know, um, this may not be the answer you're looking for, but I probably wouldn't be reading the sex therapy literature or the sex research literature. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of phenomenology, existentialism and experiential psychotherapy. And that's where I'd be reading. So the person who mentored me was the founder of experiential psychotherapy, a guy named Dr. Elmar, who had written two books about optimal personality development. And if I had to tell people what to read, I'd be reading his stuff. Um, and his name is not spelled the way it sounds. So um, Mars name sounds like, you know, the planet, but it's spelled M-A-H-R-E-R, -E Al or Alvin R. Mar. And everything that I know about personality theory that has been at the underpinnings of how I came to be studying optimal sexual experience was from everything that he taught me about optimal experience. 
so I would say, yeah, let's go outside the box of studying sexuality alone. Let's study human potential. And I'm grateful to him and miss him every day. He was my mentor for almost 30 years. Wow. I first met him as a teenager. And yeah, he was originally from Ohio. And I was so lucky that I had him to mentor me for so many years until his death. Wow. wow. Well, look, on that note, um, do you have a closing thought or word for us? Something to, to leave the, the, the audience with? Thank you. I really appreciate your interest in learning more about what makes us all glow in the dark. What are the stuff that dreams are made of? Um, I really appreciate your inviting me on to talk about the things that are my passion rather than just the usual stuff. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. You're doing really important work. Um, and I'd love to follow up with you in, in the future. Keep us, keep us up to date on any new research that you guys do. I'll look forward to it. Thanks so much.